Hey, welcome to Tahoe Forest Church. It's uh, great having everybody here. Uh, on, uh, well, yesterday I was kind of reflecting like, oh man, this is like the first sunny weekend we've had and I was getting really excited and then I woke up this morning and uh, I saw a little bit of, of white powdery stuff on, on the cars this morning. Uh, thankfully, I, we're in Glenshire, so I think it'll be mostly melted off when we get home, but those of you in Tahoe Donner probably have about an hour of shoveling ahead of you later today. <laughs> Um, but you probably didn't come here to think about that. You probably came here to, to escape that. So uh, how about we uh, come on in, uh, find a seat, and let's uh, lift our hands and our voices. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain. Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is real. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of Jesus 
Before we go into this bridge, um, I want you guys to just let the let the lyrics just kind of wash over you, um, because this this really is the gospel message, um, the good news in its simplest form. Uh, so just let's uh, let's lift our voices and sing this gospel. My debt is paid; it is paid in full in the precious blood. Jesus filled now the curse of sin has no hold on me when the sun sets free is free indeed the debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled now the curse of sin has no hold again 
Take this mountain weight. Take this mountain away. Take these ocean tears. Hold me through the trial. Come like hope again. It's you in a fight, seems like. I'll praise you, even when it hurts like hell. I'll praise you, even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing your praise. Oh, oh I will only sing your praise. Oh, oh I will only sing. All these pieces broken and scattered in mercy gathered, mended in whole, empty hands.
take our failure. You take our failure. You take our weakness. You set your treasure in jars of clay. So take this heart. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you so much for this beautiful morning. Thank you for the sunshine. Thank you for the dusting of snow, Lord. And thank you for this time that we get to come together and worship you and just hear from you and your word, God. I pray that you would speak to every single person in this room personally, to their heart and to their situation, Father. And I pray that you would help us to glorify you in every day and every way that we can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Welcome to church, everyone. Would you greet one another? Go grab some coffee. Middle schoolers, head back to the office.
take a little, move it a little bit. Uh, he's not using that. I am. Oh, you are. Do you want to use the table? Good with the table? Yeah, I'm good with the table. It's fine. Welcome, everyone. Grab a seat, find a seat. We're going to get started. All right. Hey, if, uh, middle school reminder, if you are a middle school student, you're headed back with Michelle, so see you later. Back with Michelle, middle school students, head back. Um, good morning. If you don't know me, my name is Ryan. I am privileged to be one of the staff members here. I'm the director of operations and I help with the leadership program. Um, anyone mapped out the, the route? down here past the potholes I mean I you should see my tracks in the snow it's like this going around I'm like oh I got it this time I'm gonna nail it and then I bought them out uh, we're making progress um, keep your keep us in your prayers with um, we're just talking to folks in town looking at bids looking at how we can maybe uh, get this get this place paved and more accessible so we'll keep you posted on that um, but thanks for bearing with us during this hard winter and, and the condition of the road um, Hey, we have Easter right around the corner. Uh, we're a little light on signups, uh, so we need you. We have a, a big plan, big vision. We're going downtown, well, to the rec center. I think last year we had 500 some people there. The parking lot at the rec center was full. So we're so excited. It's going to be amazing. We need you to volunteer. You can do that at the hub. You can do that online. Um, so please look and see how you can, how you can serve. Uh, high school summer camp, middle school summer camp, kids summer camp, all of those camps are coming online this Thursday for registration. Um, so if you don't know the dates, check those out at the hub, but get ready uh, to sign up this Thursday. Um, also, one more plug for Easter. You, you found some of these in your chair. We printed about 500 of these. Uh, we want to give these all away. Um, I just There's a spot where you can write to your neighbor, just bring it down your street, put those in the mailbox. Um, and invite those that you care about. So please take those home. There's more uh, on the back in the back if you want to um, pick up several. Just an update financially. Um, we're so blessed for all of you who serve, who are here um, in the mornings, uh, who are coming in to, to practice, or just in the ways that you are serving the church. Thank you. Uh, thank you for blessing us with your resources. Uh, we can't do what we do without you. Uh, there's two ways to give. You can give online. We've got our boxes here that you can give to. Uh, and just update. February and March tend to be lean months in the church. We didn't hit our, our goals uh, for March uh, and February. So if you have us in, uh, in, your, in your blessings and you're able to give, thank you for doing that. Uh, I am so excited and, and honored to introduce uh, Dave Heitman, uh, who will be giving the message today. Uh, Dave is um, a professor down at William Jessup, and he has studied and worked in over 25 countries most recently as a pastor in starting churches for almost seven years in New Zealand. Yeah, New Zealand got a shout out of all those 
Thanks. Uh, in addition to ministry, Dave has worked in Christian higher education since 2001, completing his doctorate in innovation and leadership from University of the Pacific. He's passionate about developing future leaders. His area of research and expertise include leadership stress resilience and leading innovation. Dave serves on several nonprofit boards and is now a full-time faculty member and director of graduate studies at Jessup. After our message today, Dave is staying uh, and we'll start at 1130 uh, and we'll do a deeper dive on the subject of living out faith on mission. So we invite all of you um, to stick around at 1130, join us. Uh, he'll also be speaking to our resident leaders. Uh, we'll have some refreshments in the back. Um, there's time to grab extra coffee, uh, but then we'll, we'll circle up and, and have a, some additional time with, with Dave. So please stay if you're able to do that. And I'd love to introduce Dave now. Thank you. I brought my own. Hey, thanks, Ryan. And uh, good morning. Good to see you all this morning. If you have your Bibles, do you got them? Uh, either on an app or the uh, unit member paper and covers, bindings, pages. We are looking at Hebrews 11. And put one finger in Hebrews 11, Genesis 12. Hebrews 11 and Genesis 12. And while uh, you're turning there, I'm going to pull up my notes here. Last time I was here was with our student leaders from Jessup. It was August, and it was hot, and uh, it didn't look anything like this. So it's been a pleasure. If potholes were for points, I think I might have won this morning. I hit almost every one. Like, the bigger the pothole, the more points. So, yep, that was me. But uh, two years ago, we tried to come up, but it was, uh, it was too smoky. So I've seen this place in a number of different uh, shapes and forms, but I have never been here for church. I do know Terrence. Terrence has been so kind to come and share with our students. Um, awesome, and it's a privilege. I understand that you are going through sort of a mini-series, a three-part, and this is the third of three. Uh, you began with uh, singles. Is anybody single here this morning? You. All right. And then we talked about marrieds, I believe, last week. Any married couples in the house? All right, married couples. And this morning, what do you think we're going to be talking about? Families, that's right. Anybody with kids in the house? All right. And any grandparents in here? Let's give a big round of applause to our grandparents. <laughs> awesome. All right. Hopefully you're there. And uh, I'm really bad at multitasking. So I talk and then I forget to pull up my notes. So here we are. We're going to be talking about two things this morning, tents and altars. Tents and altars, talking about living out faith on mission as a family. What does that look like? And so we're going to be looking, starting with Hebrews chapter 11, often known as the Hall of Faith. But if you actually read the characters and their bios in the, in the Hall of Faith, it could easily be known as uh, the Hall of, of um, shame and, and failure and brokenness. And I didn't get it right, and yet God still used me. And I don't know if you can relate to all that, but I certainly can. So I come from that space and place here this morning. Hebrews 11, beginning in verse 1. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the convictions of things not yet seen. For by it the people of old have received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what was seen was made not by the things that were visible. Now skip down to verse uh, 6. And without faith, it's impossible to please him, that is God. For whoever would draw near to God must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. In the King James, it says, diligently seek him. Let's pray this morning. Father, we ask that you would clear our heads and our hearts, that you would create space for your Holy Spirit to come and speak to us through the power of your word. This is not man's best intentions to live out a life that would please you. But God, unless you show up, Lord, we're nothing. But because you have shown up in the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ and the resurrection, which we're going to be celebrating here in a few weeks' time, we have all the hope of heaven. Even when we can't see it, we have the hope that the things that are invisible have been made visible. And Lord, we thank you for that this morning. I pray that you would just get me out of the way and that we would hear directly from you in this space, in your name, amen. 
Amen. Well, I don't usually do this, but uh, I, I didn't think you would trust my credibility unless I actually showed you a picture of my family. So this is my beautiful family. They make me look good. Um, that's all I got to say about that. That's my wife, Melissa. We met in college. We've been married. It'll be 21 years, May 25th coming up. Um, our oldest there is, uh, well, just a little bit about my wife first. First of all, she's amazing. And I married way over my head. Any other guys here married way over your head? This would be a good time for you to raise your hand. That's gonna, <laughs> I'm going to help you guys here today. <laughs> raise your hand. Um, She's a, uh, she's a uh, three-quarter time teacher, but if any of you are in education, half time, three-quarter time just means one and a half times worth of work. And so she is a, a supervisory teacher for a charter school. We live down in Roseville area, and she's doing that. Um, my oldest son there is Noah, and uh, we're at that age and stage of life where he is going to be leaving us. We are literally shipping him off in a couple of months from now. So everything is like, oh, it's the last or whatever. Um, he's, he's, like, he's like an old soul in a young person's body. Um, he and his brother Corbin there are both competitive swimmers, and uh, their coaches were Navy, and so they got it in their head. They want to go to Navy. So when I say shipping them out, we are literally shipping him out. Uh, he's been nominated to the Naval Academy. He's waiting to see if he gets an appointment. And... Uh, all right, got a couple of Navy guys. We got one New Zealand guy and a couple of Navy guys here. Good, so we're good. We got some connections going. Uh, so he's waiting to see if he gets an appointment there. Otherwise, he got a, a Naval ROTC scholarship. He'll be going down to university in beautiful San Diego, uh, where actually he was born and where I met my wife. Corbin, competitive swimmer. Corbin has no middle gear. It's either first or fifth. There's nothing in between. When that guy is on, he's on. When he goes to sleep, like... We literally have a shared photo album with, my, with Noah and I, where we call it the Schlumped album, where he just passes out on staircases, on couches, curled up next to the dog in the dog bed. Like, we have literally found him in all sorts of different places and places. It was his 16th birthday yesterday, and so we had a big party with him. It may have involved throwing axes, and so they're not with me here uh, today. Nobody was harmed, but that was yesterday. Hope, my, uh, my daughter, she, uh, both my boys are in um, public high school. She is homeschooled and uh, because all she wants to do is dance. So she is in a ballet company, and she just dances like 16 hours a day. She's crazy, um, super talented, and that is her jam. And our youngest, Haley, uh, joined our family five years ago now. Haley, uh, we adopted, and uh, she has been such a blessing and such a stretching, wonderful, beautiful I don't even, the words can't even describe um, what she has brought to our family, but we weren't complete, and we didn't know that until she came in. So that, that is Haley. On one end of the spectrum, we have one kid going off to, to college and maybe the Naval Academy. On the other, we are navigating what does an intellectual disability look like, what does trauma look like, what does uh, parenting a child who says they hate you um, look like, and, um, you know, what does all that entail? So it is a beautiful chaos that is, that is our home. That's our place, and that's where we come from. What does that all mean for looking on mission? Um, when I was chatting with Terrence over email the past couple of weeks, he said, you know, just start off with, you know, what does culture say about family, and then what does God say about it, and then challenge yourself and challenge all of us to live up to what God has for us as, as a family. So I said, well, okay, that sounds good. And I, I posed a prompt because I'm a professor and that's what I do. I just ask questions. Um, and uh, I've been playing around a little bit with uh, chat GPT. Anybody been playing around with AI a little bit? It's scary. Um, but I just chat, I chatted uh, in this prompt. What is the current state of American family? And use statistics and useful information because you can qualify your conversation with chat GPT. And this is what it came up with. I did fact check these, because you never know. Um, but it said the American family has undergone significant changes over the past few decades. Here are some statistics and information that describe the current state of the American family. Family structure. According to the US Census Bureau, the percentage of married coupled families has declined from 78% in 1950 to 50.7% in 2019. The percentage of single parent families has increased from 9.1% in 1960 to 25.9% in 2019. The divorce rate in the United States has declined. It has declined over the past few decades. 
but still remains relatively high. According to the National Center of Health Statistics, the divorce rate in 2019 was 2.6 per 1,000 people. I thought that was interesting, so I did a little bit more digging into that. It has declined, but you have to factor that in and qualify it with the fact that the marriage rate has hit a 50-year low in 2020. That only there's 28.1 marriages per 1,000 unmarried women in the U.S. So while divorce has declined, so has marriage on, a, on, on, the, on the whole uh, precipitously. All right, children. The percentage of children living with two parents has declined over the past few decades. In 2020, it was 65% of children lived with two married parents, while 24% lived with a single mother, 4% with a single father, and 4% with neither parent. Uh, since we're an adoptive family, I can tell you that there are 48,000 children right now in this state alone, state of California, that are looking for a forever home, yeah, just in this state. Um, the family size, the average family size in the United States has declined over the past few decades. In 1970, the average family was 3.14 members, while in 2020, the average family had 2.52 mem members. I don't know how you count a 0.52. I'm just kidding. Um, working parents. The percentage of working mothers in the labor force has increased significantly over the past few decades. In 2020, there 70.5% of mothers with children under the age of 18 were in the labor force. The level of education of parents has significant impact on the well-being of children, according to the U.S. Census Bureau. In 2020, there 33% of adults aged 25 and older had a bachelor's degree or higher. And lastly, family income has a significant impact on the well-being of children. In 2020, the median household income in the U.S. was $67,521. However, there is a significant income inequity gap with the 20% of households earning more than half of all the income. Here's the summary. While the traditional nuclear family structure of married parents with children is still common, there has been an increase in single parent families, a decline in family size, and an increase in working mothers. Parents' education levels and incomes continue to impact children's well-being significantly. It doesn't take too long to watch a family sitcom or a movie to get the idea that culture's view of family is, is somewhat negative. It usually shows a sitcom with a, what I would call a sad clown dad, a frustrated mother, and some pretty disrespectful kids. It's sort of stereotypical. On the other end of the continuum, if there is a continuum, you have maybe in some Christian cultures where the family is the ideal. That is what we are all supposed to aspire to be which leaves often little place for um, godly singleness and God's plan uh, for those that may not have children or may not be able to have children. So with all of that, what do we actually view in terms of what God views as significant? What is God's view of what is important? Well, family is included in this, but this would go for everything. As I read through Scripture, what I find surprises Jesus the most, and it's funny that Jesus is surprised, but he is, it's one thing. It's faith. He's surprised by when faith is expressed in large ways. Think of the widow's might. She gave everything. Think of the centurion's faith. You don't need to come and see what I, I have here at home, the sick person. You just come and you say the word. And then conversely, you see the surprise and his amazement at the lack of faith. Where is your faith to the disciples, those who were closest to him? God is who he says he is and can do what he says he can do. And as we grow in our maturity and our walk with God, one of the ways that that can be measured is by our faith. Do we actually believe God is who he says he can, is and can do what he says he can do? And the strongest relationships that I want to lift up here are the fact that God still works with people who express big faith. And one of the families in the scriptures that express some of the biggest faith are, of course, Abram. And Sarah, later Abraham and Sarah, sorry, from Sarai to Sarah, and their son, Isaac, the son of promise. So I want to talk a little bit in the short amount of time we have here this morning about that. Now, the entire Old Testament, let me just sum it up this way. The entire Old Testament can be summed up in two words. Effectively, God is saying two words. Trust me. The entire Old Testament. Trust me. 
I'm going to reveal myself to you through the law, through a special people that I call out my name. I'm going to take you out of slavery and bondage. I'm going to start with one person and their family, and I'm going to say, trust me. And God really hasn't changed that MO much. But he's going to show it in two ways, through faith, uh, through faith of Abram and Sarai, through f- tents and altars. Tents and altars. Hebrews 11, verse 6, we already read it, but with, without faith, it's impossible to please God. But he or she that comes to him must believe that he is and that he is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Skip back over to Genesis 12. Keep your finger there in Hebrews 11. We're going to come back. But Genesis 12, we get the story of Abram. We'll get a synopsis back in Hebrews 11. But I want to go back to the original source, Genesis 12. Beginning in verse 1, the Lord says, Now the Lord said to Abraham, Go from your country and from your kindred and from your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and I will make your name great, so that you will be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. And him who dishonors you I will curse, and in him and in you all families of the earth shall be blessed. That's God's plan for blessing through faith. I'm going to call you out from what you're comfortable and what you're familiar with, and I want you to go. I want you to go. But before God calls you to step out in faith, he, God always makes a promise. And he's saying here that I will bless you. I will be with you. You don't know where you're going, but I know the way. And I'm also at that destination point. I will be with you. Before God moves, God always makes a promise. Now, somebody once counted, there's over 3,000 promises in the Bible. Turn to your neighbor and share just 10 of them. I'm just kidding. Do you have five? Three. There's 3,000 promises. Before God asks you to do anything, he makes a promise. And that's challenging for me as I, as I even say that. I'm like, here's Abraham who this is before the law, this is before Christ, this is before, and he's exercising faith. How much more do we have? Abraham didn't have a Bible. He was in the land of the Ur of the Chaldees, which history notes is one of the most pagan lands of, uh, of antiquity, and yet God called him out of that because God has something more. Didn't tell him what he was going to find, just said, I'm going to bless you, and everyone that blesses you is going to be blessed and I'm going to have your back, is essentially what he says. And God is saying, this is who I am. This isn't just what I do. This is good because I'm good. And I need you to trust me on that. So God makes the promise, and then God begins to move. Well, to get some context, you can read back in the chapter just previous to what we just read in Genesis 12. The last few verses of chapter 11 we see Abraham's father and his family, his nephew, Lot, who you may remember from the rest of the Genesis account. But his father uh, there, Terah, uh, fathered Nahum and Nahor and Haran and all these people. They leave Ur, but they only go about halfway and they camp out in the land of Haran, which is, I don't know what, you know, in terms of the chronological order of what was going on there, but they were starting to move towards the promised land and they stopped. And God's promise sort of got put on pause in in a way. And then you pick up in chapter 12, and God's like, now I'm calling you out. Now leave all your family. And now, like, for real go. That gives me such encouragement. Because I read some of these characters in the Bible, and I'm like, I wish I could. But, man, that would just take some incredible supernatural something. I don't know if I've got that. Well, what about Abraham? And, you know, he went part of the way, and it kind of reminds me, we were singing the last worship song about vessels and, and God shining through to the whole world. And I was thinking about 2 Corinthians 4, 7. It says, but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is from God and not from us. And here's a couple of quick observations about pots of clay, which would have been incredibly common in that day. But first of all, we're very fragile. They were clay. They were baked in an oven. They were very fragile. They were prone to brokenness, which made them vulnerable. You didn't want to put them next to the edge of the shelf when you opened the cupboard. Um, And they were incredibly common. They were used for everything. 
Now, just through those three observations, I can find and relate to all of those three. Sometimes I feel incredibly fragile, somewhat vulnerable, and totally common. And yet God is like, that's, you're like right in line for the person that I want to use. God doesn't call the equipped, maybe you've heard this, but he equips the called. God isn't looking for people with great ability. He's looking for people with great availability. His eyes literally, as scripture records, are looking throughout the whole earth, 2 Chronicles 16, 9, to show himself strong on behalf of those whose hearts are fully committed to him. Now, if God is omniscient, meaning he knows everything, and omnipresent, which means he is literally everywhere, and that verse says he's looking, how rare it is to find somebody who is totally available to be used by God. God is literally searching throughout the whole earth. He's looking for hearts. He's looking for people that don't just know a lot of stuff, but are willing to go out and do that. Putting Bible doing with Bible studying. And as one person said, when I was a college student, which just rocked me, and I always love sharing it with people, you only actually believe the parts of the Bible that you actually do. And that is super convicting. You're welcome. <laughs> but there's no other way that I could ever think to live. I wouldn't have lived overseas. I wouldn't have had friends and family halfway, literally on the uttermost ends of the earth. We live 40 minutes from the Shire, y'all. Like, literally, Bag End was in our backyard. It was gorgeous. <laughs> Hope was born there. And now we find ourselves back here, and we would never have met Haley, our youngest daughter, have we not been. And we didn't know. We just went literally going, not knowing where it was we were going to land. But Abraham gives us a challenge here, and it begins with this idea of altars. Genesis 12, hopefully you're still there. Look down with me at verse 7. You get the play-by-play, -play, verses 4 through 7. Abraham went. He saw that the land was crowded. He's not really sure what he's going to do. He finds a giant oak tree in this place called Shechem. And in verse 7, the Lord appears to Abram and he said, to your offspring, I will give this land. So what's Abram's response? He stops and he builds an altar to the Lord who had appeared to him there. You got to understand, Abram's name literally means father. And if I met somebody by the name of Father, what would be my next natural question? How many kids do you have, right? Hey, what's your name, Dad? Yep, my name's Dad. How many kids do you have? I have none. Okay, how's that going to work? Well, God gave me this promise, and he said to all of my descendants, I'm going to get all this land. How many kids do you have again? I have zero. But God one-ups it. God goes one further and he says, well, I'm going to change your name. And we don't have time, but we'll get to, you know, if you continue to read Abr Abram's story, his name changes to Abraham, which literally means the father of a whole m bunch of people. Or as we say in New Zealand, heaps. He had heaps of kids. And yet at this point, when God's naming him, God's almost giving a promise over his life, saying, Father, okay, that's not good enough. Father of many. Why? Because I'm your father. And so Abram's response to that is, I'm going to build an altar. He could have easily said, what descendants? What land? It's completely occupied. God, you know, I don't know if you realize this. Maybe I should inform you of this fact. But it is in this place and in this state and in this situation and circumstance that Abram builds an altar. Here's some observations about altars. They're a place of dying. They're where things go to die. There's no way of sugarcoating that. We have nice, beautiful worship, and it's amazing. But in an altar, sacrificial sense, it's a place of dying. It's also a place that's going to cost you something. You don't get back what has then been killed. It is gone forever. Like, literally, you've let go of that. But that constitutes worship. And an altar, when you go to worship at one of these significant places, begins to alter the worship er, A L T A R begins to A L T E R, the worshiper. 
So here's Abraham. He's about 75 years old with his elderly wife, Sarai. They're literally backpacking in this place with a promise from God. By all accounts, he left a very wealthy life. And they're there going, God, unless you show up, I don't know what we're going to do. And they're worshiping. I don't know if that would have been my first response. I probably would have been Googling it. <laughs> I probably would have been doing my research because I'm a researcher. I may have asked chat GPT, like, how do I, like, phrase this? How do I get a job? Sending my resume out. And yet he's there worshiping, sacrificing. And yet before God asks anything of us, he first gives everything of himself. Paul points out this fact in Romans chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. He says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. It's reasonable. Why? Because God already sacrificed himself for you. He's not going to ask you to sacrifice or give up anything that he hasn't first given up himself. So Paul says this is a right way to respond. It's a response. And do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you can prove what that good and acceptable and perfect will of God is. And guess what Abraham's doing? He's proving God. Just like Romans 12, 1 and 2 says. Why do you respond? Because it is a response to what God has already done. How does that look? It looks like you're proving God. Abraham proved God. And you know what God did? He never made Abraham look like a fool. Maybe for a time, but keep reading the story. Heaps of stone and wood do not a worshiper make. Let me just drive this point home before we leave this. Heaps of stone and, and, and wood do not a worshiper make. It is only worship when you put fire to it. I'm pretty good about making my life look like such a way that I've got a really good pile of stones and I got a whole lot of wood and I got some rope and I got the sacrifice. But until something is there in the sense of a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, I have quickly, from my own experience, understood that living sacrifices don't like to stay on altars very long because they know it's coming. And yet, God is saying, this is reasonable. It's not until an offering dies and is literally consumed by fire that worship has then taken place. It's true that altars are a place of dying, but it's equally true that they're a place of finding. Look what Jesus said. He said, for whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if you're a woman if they gain the whole world and they forfeit their soul? Or what shall I, a man or a woman, give in return for their soul? Matthew 16, 25. That's the dichotomy and the upside down uh, life that God is proposing. And it goes for your family as well. In some ways, singleness, Paul would point out, is like you can live fully just single-minded for Jesus. Like you going for it. But then you have a spouse. And then you've got those innocent kids in the back seat. I like to think about it this way. I'm going where, not knowing where I'm going. And I look in the back seat and I've got these three sets of eyes like this is when we were in New Zealand, and, and they all look at you like, Dad knows what he's doing. <laughs> Some of you are laughing. My wife was not laughing. <laughs> She's looking at me like, I know you don't know what you're doing, but you better be hearing from the Lord. I'm with you. She literally said these words, I'm with you, but you better be hearing from the Lord. She's awesome. And that awesome weight of responsibility really was felt in that moment. I'm sure Abram was feeling that sense. And yet Christ is saying, man, if you lose, you will actually find. That is the upside down kingdom. And that's what I'm offering. And it's, and it's sacrifice and worship. But guess what? It's going to alter you in such a way that you're going to be receiving blessing. And not just for you, but all nations through you. It's crazy. But it can happen with you and your family. That's number one, altars. But number two is this idea of, of tents. Look at verse 8, just the next verse in Genesis 12. From there, he, Abram, moved to the hill country on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and Ai on the east. And there he built an altar, there it is again, to the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed on, still going on to the Negev. 
So here he is. He's building altars, and he's living in tents. Those are my two points in this message. You're worshiping on altars, and you're living in tents. So if altars make worshipers, what do tents make? They make pilgrims. Somebody that's not going to be staying around here forever. Somebody that is passing through. And here's the big difference. It's not a vagabond. It's not a drifter. He's not homeless. The delineation point with a pilgrim is they are moving to a certain destination. Pilgrims came to Plymouth Rock, right? They had a destination in mind. They just weren't there yet. They were moving and operating in such a way, and this time and space, in the present, for something that was future, something that was not yet. So if altars make worshipers, tents make pilgrims. And Abram never lived in a house. It never recorded that he owned any land other than the plot of ground that he buried his family in. That was the only thing out of all of God's promise. God, show me the money. Remember that movie? <laughs> show it to me, and I'll go. I will do it. Make sure there's a house there when we land. I will go wherever. And Abram says, you go and you, you live in tents and altars. We lived in San Diego. It was rough. It was 75 degrees year-round and full of tacos, and it was amazing. And our first two boys were born there, and God put on our hearts for New Zealand. And that's a whole other story. But we went to New Zealand. Um, have you many of you have seen um, the Jesus Revolution? Greg Laurie. So we went down to New Zealand with Greg Laurie as a pastor with Calvary. And so we went down there and we did this big outreach in the city of Wellington, the capital city of Wellington. And when we landed, we left from San Diego and we spent a number of years in Wellington, about three and a half years. And then we launched off and we went about five and a half hours north in the Bay of Plenty there in a city called Tauranga. And we started a church and we were there about three and a half years. And before we left Wellington, the women in the Bible study my wife was a part of gave her this sign. It's a train board stop. It's a stops on a train. And it begins with San Diego, where we left from, and it ends in Tauranga. That's where we're going to be church planning. And every one of those names is a street that we lived on in those three and a half years. <laughs> this is a big deal in our house, especially for my wife, who was like, I've got small children. <laughs> Like, your world doesn't change. Like, you get to open the Bible. It's still the same Bible, still the same gospel, just different people, kind of different accent, more vowels in the words. You know, it's like, but your word doesn't change. Everything in my world just changed. I can't drive on the same side of the road. I don't even know how to buy paper towels. People yell at me. I don't know what to send my kids to school with. I got to buy them uniforms. They came back without shoes on. I don't know what is going on here. It is a different place. And deceptively so, because it's not third world. It's Majority white, English speaking, so you don't expect it. But the culture shock is even much more destabilizing. Mm -hmm. So we come there without a house and all this stuff. And so we first land there on Bangkok Crescent. People in the church that didn't even know us that were on summer holiday, we just were like, here's the keys to our house. Live there till we get back in two weeks. We're like, okay. And then we moved in with a young couple who were like been married one year that lived on Blue Mountains Road. So we lived there for like four weeks where we're trying to rent a place. And the first place we rented was Salford Street. We moved to New Zealand when my wife was uh, six months pregnant. My daughter Hope was born three months after we arrived. And we had no central heat, no insulation, and single pane or single glazed windows. Literally, we'd close the windows and the curtains would blow at night. So my daughter, she would be in this, like, fuzzy onesie, like, with just a little face, kind of like Ralphie's little brother on um, Christmas Story. Like, that was my daughter growing up, and she'd have purple lips. Every morning, we'd wake her up. That girl is impervious to cold. We went snowboarding on Friday. She doesn't feel cold at all. Like, it was part of the way she was raised. But that's the house, and we had to get out of that house. So we temporarily stayed with a pastor who was away on vacation for another couple of weeks on Radstock Road, and then we found a, like, townhouse with central heat. It was amazing. Earl Stoke Crescent. And then one of the elders came to us and said, I have a second house. Do you want to live in it for free? And I said, free is a great price, especially when we're church planning. Let's move. And that was on Aurora Street. And we had one more gap in that, that canvas for the, uh, for the train stops. And so we put Hania Street, which was the street that the church was on that we were 
serving in. And that was the one consistent. And then we moved to Tauranga. These are like our Ebenezer stones. These are our memorial stones. Every one of those houses has a story. Every one of those places is where we pitch our tent. Every one of those is like, oh, that was freezing. <laughs> oh, but God, you provided. And we're still alive. Like, we're you're still so good. On the back of that, you can't see it, but we have handwritten now in pencil every street that we've lived on since. And it's a story of God, how God's moved us as a family. And I was so convicted. A couple years ago, we started telling stories around the dinner table of, like, what it was like when we had no money, like I was church planning and selling surfboards full time to make money, and, um, and then like doing the church plant thing out of this senior center. And it was this crazy, crazy mess. And um, checks would just randomly show up in the mail. Oh, my kids came back from a youth group thing, and there was a missionary there, and they said checks came. And they're like, isn't that awesome? The Lord would do that. And I'm like, the Lord's done that in your story. They're like, we had no idea. Remember, they were the kids in the backseat going like, we got it all together, parents. <laughs> like, no, we don't. Like, that stuff was literally happening to us. We had no idea that it was going to happen. And then he's like, why don't you tell those stories to us? Oh, okay. We're still living on mission. This is what that looks like. Here's the story. Here's how it's going. And yet Abraham went out not knowing where he was going, and he, he, he was filled with God and his, his spirit. Man, I don't have time to tell you everything, but let me just wrap up by, by going back to Hebrews 11. Because this is where Abraham really turns the corner. He wasn't just living for the here and now. He was living for the there and the then, which he didn't know what it was going to look like. Hebrews 11, verse 8. Hebrews 11, verse 8. It says, by faith, Abraham obeyed, and he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to the live in the land of promise, as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. Those are his family. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God, and, and Sarah as well. She herself received power to conceive, even when she was well past the age, since she considered him faithful who had made the promise. And as numerous as the stars and the sand, skipping down to verse 14, for the people who speak like this, they make it clear that they're seeking a homeland. And if they had been thinking about the land in which they had gone out, they would have had the opportunity to go back. But as it is, they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Here's your homework. If you want to keep reading the story of tents and altars, it's throughout Abraham's life in Genesis. What you'll notice is that when they go down to Egypt, because there's a famine and they flee, they never make an altar and they never pitch a tent. As soon as he comes back to the land of promise, first thing he builds is an altar and pitches a tent. They have this... Uh, internal familial conflict with Lot. There was too much in such a small space. And Lot says, I'm going to take Sodom and Gomorrah. And what does it do? What does Lot do? It says he pitches his tent towards Sodom. Where you pitch your tent matters. There's so many things about tents and altars. But what I want to wrap up with is that the story of the gospel really is a picture of tents and altars, that Jesus left his home in heaven, his father, to come out to live in a tent, literally to put on flesh. And then literally to go to an altar. And I'm so thankful that he didn't hold back to do that. It wasn't about his comfortability. It wasn't about the family. It was about, God, I'm going to listen to you so that there might be more that would come in. So that you and I can realize at some point, he did it for you. He did it for me. He did it for us. He did it for my family. Let me just tell you, it was not a popular thing to take all the grandkids and move halfway around the world. And my parents let me know it. And my in-laws let me know it. And yet through that wrestle with 13-hour flight from San Francisco to Auckland to cry and think about what are we doing, the Lord spoke to me really clearly. He said, the best place for your family, your immediate and your extended, is to be exactly where I have called you to be. There is no better place for you and your family is to be where God has called you to be. 
And the place where that is is the place where you worship at altars and you live in tents. Father, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for my friends in this place and for wherever you're at and in the story of your work in their life. I pray that you would bless them immeasurably more than they could ever hope or imagine, that you would become greater. Whatever sacrifice in this life, God, may it pale in comparison for what's coming in that heavenly city. God, we thank you for calling us your own. And Lord, we thank you for calling us as a family, as a married couple, as a family, as an extended family, as a mixed family, as an adopted family, as a foster family. Lord, you've adopted us into Christ and we're family because of your blood, even as a church family. Father, thank you for making that possible. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Bless you guys. All right. Thank you, Dave, for joining us this morning, giving us a, the sharing the word with us this morning. He's going to be sticking around, like Ryan said earlier, uh, here in just uh, about 15 minutes. We're going to be right here, uh, and he's going to be going a little bit deeper and covering some more, uh, uh, covering some more scripture on this and talking about uh, how to live out your faith on mission, right? So uh, I'll be right here in 15 minutes. If you could do us a favor, uh, we need help just moving some chairs out of the way. We're going to leave about 20 chairs right here and stack the rest of them out in the way or however many we need for people who are going to stick around. Um, uh, and you can stay right here to join us. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to join us this morning as we uh, worship and hear from God's word. Have a blessed week, and we'll see you next week. See you, church.